Okay, obviously nobody has the slightest idea as to why I'm here, and I'm not even going to be broadcasting this for some time, but obviously I'm here at Skyrora. Let's head on in. So at the time that I filmed that little shaky clip, I was actually already aware of the fact that Skylark L was going to be making a launch attempt from Northern Iceland. I couldn't share this information because I had signed a non-disclosure agreement, but still, I was very excited, and lots of other people were too, actually, as to the prospects of this suborbital launch by a multi-stage rocket. But unfortunately, as many of you probably know, the whole thing was a big anti-climax of the First Order. And on the same day, that is yesterday, I got an update on the ongoing drama between Blue Origin and ULA and the BE-4. I got lots of clarifications as to the cause of the delay, exactly how long the delay is going to be and who's going to be involved in this launch, and whether or not it's going to be happening before Starship makes a successful orbital test. We'll see how all of that goes, but you're going to be getting an update on both of these issues in part one of my double shot bulletin day in just a moment. Hello YouTube, I'm the Angry Astronaut and this is... Hello everyone and welcome to part one of a double shot of bulletins today and I would ask you to please not skip over this part just because it happens to be about UK spaceflight because I can tell you uh, Skyrora went through a tremendous amount of effort to try to make this happen. They fought impossible environmental conditions in Iceland. The very infrastructure was kind of falling apart as they were attempting to get into position, entire roads being washed away, actually. So the fact that they were even able to attempt this was nothing short of miraculous, especially on the short time frame that they had at their disposal. And it was indeed a Herculean effort to get everything into place and then to make the attempt. However, I would be compromising my integrity as a journalist to call this as anything other than a setback. And Skyrora would not disagree with me on that. I have a quote here from Lee Rosen, the uh, chief operations officer at uh, Skyrora, who I had an opportunity to interview in Paris. Thank you very much, Mr. Rosen. He's a 10-year SpaceX veteran, and here's what he said. Quote, with over three decades in the business, I can assure you that despite the best design, build, and test preparations, anomalies still unfortunately do happen. Skyrora's launch attempt of Skylark L has provided the team with valuable experience in operations procedures, logistics coordination, and execution of the rapid setup and pack down of our mobile launch complex, experience which will propel us forward monumentally in our mission to reach orbit. We are delighted to have had the support of the Icelandic government and the local, and I think it's Pjörstjön, but I'm once again, I'm sure I'm totally wrong on that, community for this launch attempt. It is a true sign of the strengthened relationship at the heart of European space effort. So, yeah, putting on a brave face, no doubt, and I am sure that they did gain a fair amount of information, even though the rocket only managed to achieve about one to two hundred meters in height before it went plunging into the North Atlantic, but... Nevertheless, um, a test is a test. These sorts of things happen. They've happened to SpaceX multiple times, and they're going to happen to companies like Skyrora as well. Nevertheless, this company is talking about a launch in 2023. Is that still really possible? Well, I'll tell you, I had an opportunity to actually tour their facilities. Don't have any footage of that, hoping, hoping to get some of that from Skyrora later on, but I saw their 3D printing operation. I met with their engineers and technicians. I had an opportunity to really see the entire operation, to see completed engines for Skylark XL, which is the next version up from the Skylark L, and I have every confidence that if there's anybody in Europe that can overcome a setback like this and still launch in 2023, it would be Skyrora. 
that being the case, though, um, just about everybody that I've spoken to in the industry over here in the UK when asked, do you think if Skyrora can actually make it orbit in 2023, the general consensus is that it is, in fact, impossible. However, once again, uh, a lot of these people haven't actually seen their operations. They haven't seen the engines. They haven't seen how they make the engines. I've seen a lot of this, and I think that it is possible. Likely? Mm, probably not. But at the same time, I'm not going to put it beyond their capabilities. And Lee Rosen, with all of his SpaceX experience and tenacity, I think has the potential to take this company to the next level very soon. Let's move on to Vulcan. So yesterday I had an opportunity to learn a lot about what's going on over at ULA and the whole situation with Vulcan, and I got a number of clarifications. First of all, I definitely stand by what I said originally. I am confident that the whole situation with BE4 is largely behind the delay, simply because Blue Origin has still only delivered one flight certified engine to ULA, the second one, we're not sure when that's going to arrive or indeed when it can be fully tested. There's no way they're going to be able to achieve orbit by the end of the year under those conditions. So regardless of these other circumstances that came up, I still feel that the BE-4 is still the big culprit behind this problem, but there were other issues. The most significant of these is a pretty dramatic uh, situation with, uh, with Amazon and Kuiper and their relationship with ABL. Initially, and by the way, in case you, this company sounds familiar to you, this is the company that's going to be launching out of Saxavord in the first quarter of 2023. It would appear that Amazon has lost confidence in ABL, at least to some degree, and aren't going to trust them to launch launch the first two test articles of their Kuiper Constellation on one of their rockets. Um, and I don't know all the circumstances behind that, aside from the fact that there does seem to have been sort of a a uh, degradation in their level of confidence um, over the last few months in ABL. I don't know if that's warranted, but nevertheless, that's the decision that they made, and they decided to transfer those two test article Kuiper satellites over to this Vulcan flight. It's an interesting mission configuration, and it really increases the complexity of what ULA is trying to do. Because obviously ULA is not trying to go to low Earth orbit where Kuiper is supposed to be deployed. They're going to the moon, which means the Centaur upper stage is going to have to dump off those two Kuiper satellites and then push Peregrine the rest of the way. It complicates the entire mission and indeed could be a big part of why there is a delay in the launch framework. But still, Kuiper is an incredibly important customer to ULA. They have dozens of launches planned for the Kuiper Constellation and Vulcan, so it's important that they keep Amazon happy so I can see why this is going on. But still, now it is a two-pronged mission. Peregrine and Kuiper and these things Things being deployed to two very different locations. That alone led to the delay. So the new date is February 15th. That is according to sources close to ULA when their next launch window for Vulcan will open up. So uh, there's a number of things that have come up with this that, as I say, have complicated matters, but there are also things that I've learned about Vulcan that are going to make it into an even more potent competitor than I originally thought. You see, as I've talked about a number of times in the past, Vulcan has a larger fairing size, a much more robust fairing size than Falcon 9. And Falcon Heavy is due to have a larger fairing delivered at some point, but they still haven't been able to do that yet. So, and you know, even when they do, the diameter of the fairing is still not going to be as big as Vulcan, which means that Vulcan is capable of deploying certain payloads for the U.S. Space Force that neither Falcon 9 nor Falcon Heavy can deploy. In addition to that, Falcon Heavy is not allowed to launch from California. They don't have clearance to do that. So that also cuts off certain opportunities for certain 
orbital configurations for Falcon Heavy and the U.S. Space Force and increases the importance of Vulcan to the U.S. Space Force. So this is a very critical situation developing with Vulcan on lots of levels that affects a lot more people than just ULA. And in case you're thinking that Starship could solve all of the Space Force's problems, you know, being able to deploy anything anywhere, Tori Bruno said something recently that's kind of interesting, and I have to admit, I think there's a lot of credence behind this. He said that both New Glenn and Starship are hobbled a bit by how heavy and gigantic the orbiters are and the fairing size, etc. Remember, Starship, the, the super heavy, will only get the orbiter up to low Earth orbit. At that point, it's pushing not only 100 tons worth of payload, but a hundred tons worth of stainless steel as well. This vehicle is really not going to be able to deploy payloads into geosynchronous orbit, which is where a lot of Space Force missions are going, without on-orbit refueling. And the Space Force is not yet convinced that on-orbit refueling is really going to be a viable solution, which means Starship is not a viable vehicle for Space Force deployment yet. It will be eventually, but not yet and neither is New Glenn, and for some payloads, large enough payloads that will be too much for Falcon 9 or Falcon Heavy's fairing size, they're not a solution either, which means Vulcan is the only rocket at the Space Force's disposal that will be able to deliver certain payloads of certain size, certain diameter, up to geosynchronous orbit, at least until on-orbit refueling can be mastered with Starship. So once again, the launch window opens up on February 15th, and I, once again, I can't be 100% on all of this. These are sources very close to ULA, um, who have never been wrong before, but nevertheless, they could be. Um, but it's not a catastrophe. I mean, we're talking a delay of maybe 50 days from where they were looking at previously, and given all the additional complications that have been added to this mission, it's actually kind of surprising that they're looking to get it going this soon, but they have to. They have to get this mission completed. They have to get Dream Chaser completed in time for a September launch through the Space Force. Will they be able to win this race? Will they win my race to get Vulcan to the moon before Starship carries out a successful orbital test? Oh, and by the way, I need to get to 100,000 subscribers as well. Otherwise, I'm not putting a tattoo anywhere. So please subscribe. Let's make this into a fun little competition because believe me, I think it's a serious race right now. I no longer think it's going to be a walk in the park for Vulcan. I think it's going to come down to the wire. Please like, please subscribe, please check the description for various ways to support my content, and as always, stay angry about space!